G'day guys, Mackie with the Outer Circle, and today I have a special video called The Horus Heresy and the Problem of the Slowly Creeping Narrative. This was a hard video to put together. Sometimes videos are easy. You just start dribbling and content just works. You say all the right things, it feels great. This was not one of those videos. Um, it was a difficult process putting it together because it's not meant to be a aggressive video and it's not meant to be a negative video it's just a matter of fact video um, and with that in mind I constantly sort of retweaked it and reworded it and hopefully what I've come up with makes perfect sense to people who knows right uh, so it is a very talky video do try and bear it out because it has some big points to make and again it is all about the Horus Heresy it's got pretty much nothing to do with 40k so if you're here for the 40k content Maybe hang around, you might get something useful out of it, but don't expect anything relating to you per se. Anyway, on with the show. When the Horus Heresy books first released at Forge World, we knew we wouldn't get all the goods at once. In the lovely spring of 2012, at least here in Australia, it was uh, probably miserable and cold elsewhere, because, you know, Europe, America, Canada, Russia, all cold places, um, book one dropped. And with it came two lists, the Legiones Astartes Crusade Army list, and the Auto Reductor Sub list. Additionally, there were Legion specific rules released, which themed the core rules and allowed you to create a custom Legion. Each Legion had a single specialist unit, be it Justerian, Rampages, Palantine Blades, or Deshraya. And each faction also had two specialist characters, um, their Primarch and no right of war specific to them. We salivated for about a year over book one, waiting for the release of book two, reading book one over and over again, and we wondered what would book two contain? And we guessed it around a bit, and myself, my guesses were, well, logically, um, if it's not Prospero, which I hoped it was since that happened first, but it didn't pan out. Um, what I thought would happen would be the three loyalist legions that landed at Istvan. The answer came in the spring of 2013 because instead we got greeted by two loyalist and two traitor factions. The Raven Guard, they were missing in action and the Istvan campaign ignored them outright. This in my opinion was a mistake as they should have focused the initial stages of the Istvan 5 battle in this book it should have contained the loyalists attacking the entrenched traitors. The massacre should have been what happened in book three. But as it so happened, the formula became set in book two. Thankfully, fears such as power creep were not realized at this time. The new formula that was established in this book was to expand the existing core army list with the new units, followed by adding each new legion, their two specialist units, two specialist characters, custom war gear, their Primarch, and a Legion-specific right of war. Further to this, existing Legions were featured again. They would receive additional material in the form of new units, such as the Red Butchers, Reavers, Phoenix Guard, and Grave Wardens, as well as new characters, including the so-called named ones, such as Khan, Eidolon, and Typhus, or Typhon. Now, with the release only a few months later, and quite literally a week before the release of 40k 7th edition, still a fucking pathetic effort by both Games Workshop Mainstream and Forge World, which created a mess which took over a year to clean up fully, the formula laid down in Book 2 was continued by the third book, which gave us two more Loyalist Legions, somehow shoehorning in the Imperial Fists thanks to the contrived Battle of Fell, as well as rounding out the Traitor Camp. The Mechanicum was updated further, and by this stage actually had a final proper true list, with multiple options for every category, and which weren't just the same unit uh, duplicated over and over again with a different weapon. With the instant changes to the Heresy that Seventh had rushed in like a drunk guy picking a fight with a bouncer, the Heresy was thoroughly derailed. Forge World needed time to rework their plans and focus on the next stage of the narrative, namely Prospero, Cygnus, and Kalth. I can never talk enough about how much of a clusterfuck 7th edition was for the Heresy in mid-2014. But needless to say, in the Fallout Forge World rushed out the Bipolar Book 4. The campaign system was second to none, but the featured lists, the Night Households and the Solar Auxilia, they were problematic. 
The Knights were simply too strong a faction for those who were not armed to deal with them, and far too weak for those who were armed to fight with them, which is a problem persisting to this day. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, if you're a World Eaters force, heavy on infantry with things like chain axes, you're going to be in a bad way when you run into an Imperial Knight in close combat. Conversely, you're an Iron Warriors army, heavily kitted out with Tyrant Siege Terminators, Graviton weaponry, things like that, you're probably going to be in a very good place when it comes to dealing with Knights. Um, chain Fist Galore, Power Fist, that kind of thing. So, that was bad enough. On the other hand, you had Solar Auxilia, which were brutally overpowered, and they remain my most frowned upon faction in 30k to this day. They're probably the only list which could reliably take out a Custode army, I think. And this is book four, a book which is designed to fill a slot, a book which succeeds and fails in equal measure. But <laughs> for some reason, I just I love that book. Then we have book five, and this is where things started to go haywire and where the slowly creeping narrative became problematic. If you think you sense me nearing the point of this video, you're correct. Book 5 saw not only the release of the Ultramarines, but also of the Word Bearers 2.0. The problem is twofold. The Ultramarines were granted an exceptional number of units and characters, as well as a wider range of war gear than the other legions. The Word Bearers also got revisited. Now, since book 2, they hadn't been touched. And now they were getting new units, new characters, a 7th edition rewrite for their existing units, and this all brought the Legion in line with the Ultramarines, and laid out a new base power level for list functionality. For those who don't understand what I mean by this, if you went to a tournament in this time period, or an event, um, I went to several at this time, and you're talking early 2015 here, uh, you would see people running, um, say, Ultramarines and Word Bearers with Demon Allies. Well, those two factions obviously not Ultramarines allied with Word Bearers. And what would happen is they would often be some of the higher tier power levels because their rules were written very much with 7th edition in mind on their characters and units at this point, as opposed to 6th edition units. Now, by Book 5 I found myself looking at the vast changes that have taken place since the inception of the 30k uh, game as a whole. And I came to the conclusion that there was a subvert form of power creep occurring. What do I mean by this? Well, if you look at Games Workshop, they produce codexes. Codexes with units that clearly overshadow the competition, such as Eldar Wraith Knights, Tower Riptides, that kind of thing. I am talking 7th edition here, not 8th edition, which is a different kettle of fish. But these units are overt. They're easy to spot, likely driven by the need for sales and a thorough lack of playtesting. These sort of units stick out like dog's balls because they're big, they're cheap in points, they're strong units, very easy to spot. In 30k on the other hand, the designers were very well intentioned, but by giving more and more goodies to the current release, they are neglecting the earlier releases. The fact that they're releasing books in a narrative style, adhering to an in-universe calendar, where releases are based on where that faction fits into the story, rather than where it fits into the game, is a massive issue, and it's only made worse by each new release. Let's compare the Space Wolves to the Emperor's Children, a Book 7 faction, and a Book 2 faction. Let's compare the Space Wolves to the Emperor's Children, a Book 7 faction versus a Book 2 faction. On the left we have the Emperor's Children, on the right we have the Space Wolves. Both factions are aimed at close combat. But where one has a slight edge regarding initiative, the other has the edge in mobility, and charge bonuses on non-characters is essential here. The Wolves also have abilities which limit infiltrators, which is admittedly not the greatest, but still a buff that the Emperor's children lack. Regarding war gear, the Space Wolves have Wolf Followers, which are useful and relatively cheap asset. The Sonic Shrieker merely cancels out the Space Wolves charge bonus to weapon skill, and even then, it only applies against the miniatures in base contact with the model that bears the Shrieker. The Phoenix Spear, it's a fantastic weapon on the charge, but it relies on the charge. Phoenix Terminators are renowned for their weakness in close combat, with units which have 2 plus saves essentially being immune to them. The Phoenix Terminators just try and end up killing them by hitting them with pillows, it's pathetic really. Both legions possess good relics, but where the Emperor's Children player has to pick and choose wisely with theirs, 
the wolf player just gets a flat stat line for the weapon. It's kind of a microcosm for the legions themselves. But the interesting point here is that both relics were actually released in book 4, meaning they were designed at the same time and that's likely the reason why they're both about a similar power level. The final item of war gear, the Aether Rune Armor, is a ridiculously strong item, not just for the plus one wound, but because the Space Wolves Librarian with it is able to deny enemy psychers on a re-rollable 5 plus. And if they're a higher mastery level, it's on a re-rollable 4 plus. Special units wise, both legions possess interesting units, with none being particularly amazing outside of set conditions. The kicker for the wolves is again the Rune Priest which is basically a superior version of the Forge Lord, Chaplain, Pravian, Master of Signals, and Librarian Consuls. Thanks again to the Aether Rune Armor and their followers. You pay the points, but you get a great reward. And unlike items like the Phoenix Spear, you aren't relying on that charge for your equipment to work. In Book 6, we were treated to the Black Shields and Shattered Legions, which whilst being fluffy and thematic forces are also incredibly unbalanced as they allow synergies outside of the force organisation and allied charts to occur. These ad hoc formations often skew the balance so hard and unintentionally that the owners of these armies have to work to rein themselves in, because they don't want to be labelled that guy, for what is in all likelihood just a fun army. So it probably seems like I've been whinging a lot throughout this, or that I've been droning on, but the point of all this talk is that the slow release schedule and the very occasional revisiting of factions means that invariably there is a gulf where problems are arising. Whilst there is such a thing as being too quick to hit someone with a nerf bat, such as 8th edition putting out an FAQ practically the day the codex comes out, which in my opinion is a sign of mediocre playtesting, there's also the reverse of being far too slow or just not caring enough. Forge World does care, but they have limited resources and tend to focus on their passion projects, which yeah, funny enough, are not writing FAQs and fixing things uh, like blatantly unpalanced parts of the game until they have no other choice. The months it took for a 7th edition FAQ for books 1, 2 and 3 are proof enough of this, and the continued lack of a large FAQ since that time is a joke, and we are talking, what, 3-4 years at this point, almost, since that FAQ? There's no easy solution to the problem we have now, at least at this stage. Having the foresight that I did that they should have released Crusade rules simultaneously at the time of Book 1. That way all the factions at that time would have had a level playing field, something Forge World has finally done, but they've done it in Book 6, and it's a full five years after I suggested it, and it doesn't retcon or fix the problems before it came out. It only just sort of lays out a level playing field for the Blood Angels, White Scars and Dark Angels. By this point, it's far too late to undo the damage that has been done. Some might argue that the problem of creeping units and rules would still exist, and yes, it would. But the simple solution is that books that come out since that point, you could ban them, or just say a player's agreement not to use those additional units until such time as all the factions participating in that event or tournament have their late and mid heresy rules and units. Sadly, however, this has obviously never happened. The last side effect of the staggered release cycle is that if one commits to a force, they are often having to pick units from across a huge range of books, meaning that you have to bring a heap of resources along to play a game. The red books, whilst a great idea on paper, are immediately outdated every time a new book is released with more units, and eventually you start to see the old red books selling for cheap on eBay and buy, swap and sell because they're useless. They lack the fluff of the big black books, and it just makes them not worth holding on to. They possess less rules and they're outdated rules at that. So, where do we go from here? Unfortunately, Forge World it seems is committed to this release model, and with their attention being sapped away by 8th edition and the specialist games, this timeline is likely to blow out even further, with books now taking longer than when they devoted little to no manpower to them and to the heresy. Where once it took a year to go from book 1 to book 2, now it takes a year and a half if not more. Sadly, that next book also seems to be declining in quality, uh, editing quality especially and rules content, because book 7 was riddled with mistakes and vague wording especially around things like the Custode and to some extent also the Thousand Suns. 
I don't want to seem like Debbie Downer here, but I sense that this is the most dangerous thing for the heresy community. And it's something that needs to be dealt with. And not because of some nebulous threat like 8th edition or Matt Ward, but instead the very real threat of stagnation and lesser quality work alienating and dividing the community. And that close-knit community that we've built up and fostered over the last five years, built on the back of strong sense of narrative and the 30k mindset, that could all come crashing down if any sort of divide is opened, and we very nearly saw that happen between the 7th book and the 8th edition drop. They already tested the resolve of the community, and cracks showed. My advice to everyone would just be to keep in mind what I've said today, and act wisely going forward. I don't know if this video has been interesting to anyone, but do leave your thoughts and comments below, and I'll see you all next time.